What's up, everyone? This is Galem here, one of the co-hosts for the Tech Sales Experience. And it is Robert Creighton, the other uh, host of the Tech Sales Experience. And before we uh, dive into this week's episode, I want to make sure to remind you all, to, if you really enjoy this podcast, if you love Galem and I, go ahead and like, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening platform or YouTube. And not only if you enjoy our conversations, but if you really like our guests and what they're sharing in these episodes, uh, they're also members of our community on Jobski. So go ahead and join this community and you will get direct access to both of us, as well as all the guests on this podcast. And it's a really, really good way to connect with other people, to build your network and to get more questions answered as they might pop up in some of our conversations. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Don't meet us there. Beat us there. Come join us in our virtual community where you can book one-on-ones with the the great folks that we have on our podcast. You can chat with Galem and I, and you can be up to date on the different events we'll be having. Who knows? We might have a a crowdsourced uh, uh, podcast recording with just the people from our community. So you want to be in this virtual community. It's free. Go ahead and sign up and uh, enjoy this week's episode. Today's episode of the Tech Sales Experience, we wanted to kind of bring some revenue leaders and some RevOps leaders such as yourselves to uh, kind of talk about how we can support one another as uh, Black professionals. Um, And so, uh, Galen, I guess you can call this another episode of the Black Tech Sales Experience. Exactly. (laughs) Following up from last week, here we go. (laughs) Another episode of the Black Tech. (laughs) But no, for real, you know, this is, I think this is an important conversation for us to have and um, want it to be an open conversation with you all. So before we get started, I think it'd be great if you all could just do a brief introduction of yourself, just, you know, a a brief history of your uh, career and, you know, and, um, We'll, we'll dive into the conversation and we can start with uh we'll start with you jacob all right Bet. well one i appreciate y'all inviting me here when y'all talked about having a round table i didn't think it was going to be on a podcast actually i thought we were just going to chop it up and have like a private conversation <laughs> i'm gonna still pretend like it's a private conversation one way or another I'm not and, then, and then you showed up and it's yeah. already recording so yes go for it <laughs> well, the good news, hold on the good news is that this is still kind of private i mean we're not oh, joking yeah. we got like uh 10 20 views of, so i mean <laughs> i'm not got nothing to hide let's let's blow it up right all right here. that was good <laughs> um So yeah, I started my tech career. So I went, I grew up in Seattle area and then uh, moved out to Newark, New Jersey when I was in high school. Uh, Went to to a school in Hoboken called Stevens Institute of Technology. Learned about business and technology. So engineering plus uh, business on top. Uh, From there, I started my tech career um, in Jersey City, working at Avpoint. That was my first tech job. And um, then from there, I kind of had a kind of a roundabout career, worked at a Parks and Recreation in Arizona, Yuma, Arizona for a little while. That was my, my favorite job in the world. Um, then I realized I couldn't pay my student loans. So I moved to Seattle uh, and started working at Outreach. I was the second employee of Outreach back in 2015. Uh, been consulting on that software ever since, but uh, left Outreach about 2018 uh, no, 2017, worked at DocuSign for a while as a solutions engineer. Um, and then after DocuSign, moved to Hawaii. And at the time, they wouldn't let me work remote. So I had to quit my job to move to Hawaii, started working for the county of Hawaii in the, um, uh, in the council, the, the, the count for the, all the council members doing like tech stuff, even though I'm not like super techie, I was the most techie. Um, and then I was like, this doesn't pay my student loans either. So I went back into the tech uh, industry, um, started working at Sapper Consulting. Um, and then uh, Sapper Consulting got bought by um, Abstract. And I didn't wasn't feeling the vibe at Abstract. So I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna do this myself. So I started my own consulting firm, Zebra Consulting, um, where I help customers optimize and train their reps, uh, implement and really get the most out of the outreach platform. That's that's it. That's me in a nutshell. Nice. Appreciate that. Sebastian, you want you want to go next? Yeah, yeah, I'll go next. Um, 
So I came up in New York, like high school, college age. I was in New York City. I uh, kind of came to a crossroads when I graduated and it was, do you A, take a job at the Bank of America, wear a suit to work every day and move to Charlotte, North Carolina? Or do you take a series A SDR position at a 12 person startup in the middle of uh, Chinatown? And I chose a startup and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, even though as a sales rep, you know, over many years, got trapped in that manager cul-de-sac so many times. Like, I want to be a manager, but you won't let me be a manager. And so I'm not qualified to be a manager. <laughs> and so jumped around a little bit after that. You know, I've been a full cycle sales rep. I've been a team lead player coach, which I think nobody should ever do uh, ever under any circumstance. <laughs> and then, uh, Got lucky, uh, found my way into scaled consulting uh, with the CEO, Jake Dunlap. And it was, it was like a serendipitous moment. I walked into a recruiting office and someone I went to school with literally saw me by my hair, probably grabbed me and said, no, you're not going to the recruiting office. You're coming here to scale consulting and you're going to join the team. Uh, shout out to Mateo. I don't know if any of y'all have read his book, uh, Black Buck. It's a must read if you're in sales tech. Uh, but anyway, uh, I got into Scaled, quickly ramped me up to a bunch of projects, and I realized that I really enjoyed consulting, um, but I wanted to kind of do it on my own. So my, me and my business partner, Kevin Lewis, we started what was a sales ops consulting shop with just the two of us doing Salesforce work, playbook work, stuff like that. And three and a half years later, we now have a revenue operations consulting agency so here i am back being an sdr <laughs> but this time for my own business <laughs> rather than somebody else's so uh that's what i do in my day-to-day -day now demand gen for RevOps consulting very nice very nice last but certainly not least we got christian yeah so good news i actually just got uh signed so while all this was going on so hey um yeah, so Christian Freeze, um, I took a pretty non-traditional route. Um, I've always had to work throughout my life, so I never really had to had an emphasis on on education, um, if that makes sense. It's not that I'm uneducated; I graduated college, but I've always had to to provide for for my family. So I started working when I was 13. My dad actually uh, was a was an 18 wheel trucker, um, so he used to go across the United States. And I used to go with him on, uh, go with him, uh, you know, on the, in, on the summer breaks and things like that. So I, I have a love for logistics and transportation and things like that. Uh, I was a lumper, you know, in high school, which means I would essentially stand outside of like a trucking company and, you know, hopefully they would pick me to work for the day. Um, so, I mean, if I had to, you know, if I had to go and carry pianos downstairs, that's what I had to do. Um, obviously I, you know, through doing this, doing this work, I, I knew it wasn't for me. Um, I'm a, I'm a pretty small guy. I don't have all day to, to be carrying things. Um, so I got my first break at a company called OnTrack. So they're in logistics and transportation, they're a regional delivery service. I think why that's important to my career is I actually started off as an admin, um, about three months into my role there. Uh, we signed a partnership with Amazon to test out their first three-day shipping offering. Um, and I kind of just thought that was really cool um, and used the tools that were, uh, you know, I was on the fleet side, so we didn't have any technology. We didn't have a budget. So I used kind of the tools that were given to me and, and created an access database and the strategy behind it. Uh, so, you know, the trailer needs to be at this space by this time, you know, X, Y, Z in order to get this delivery um, done in three days. Uh, so I started there, obviously really wanted to get into tech. I wasn't making much money, though I felt like I was having a huge impact for, you know, a first real office job. Um, I moved over to a company, a smaller company uh, in, the, in the tech hardware space. Um, and that's where I fell in love with sales operations. It was just kind of there. And um, my boss at the time was like, yo, I think you'd be good at it. Um, I had no idea what sales operations was. So I said, yeah, just a little bit of more money. Uh, 
and I went for it. Um, during that experience, I was there for about two and a half years, but during that experience, it was, it was wonderful. I was, I was just getting visibility in all the go-to-market go orgs, um, you know, anywhere from freaking billing and collecting to customer success, sales, et cetera, et cetera. So that was fun, man. It was really, it was really cool. Um, I got, I guess I got introduced to deal desk. Um, so that was awesome. The revenue side and finance side. And then, um, you know what, we actually, I ended up getting laid off which was a blessing in disguise because my wife at my wife and I, we, we decided to go take a, a little backpacking trip uh, to Southeast Asia during the time. So we, we went out, we're still young, right? We have two kids now. So I'm glad we got that experience. We went out, did a couple yeah. countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I got back, I'm like, hey, I need a job. I fell into my first like real tech company, um, not SaaS, but it's more of like networking and hardware, Aerohive Networks as an analyst, okay. Okay. took over the deal desk there. Nice. Went over to Contentful, which is Double Unicorn. Um, and that was my first chance to be the first like real sales ops hire. Um, so I built that global team from scratch, spent two years there and hopped over to a company called Tapcart. Uh, I was the head of revenue operations there for two years. Um, it was great. Built teams. Um, really fell into, I think, my leadership qualities, and nice. and I'd like to dig into that a little bit later in the episode. But that's really what what kind of grew. Um, I feel uh, my leadership abilities. Um, nice. And so during that time, real quick, just during that time, found out we were pregnant with our second kid. Uh, I found out it was a boy. There were some things going on internally. I felt, hey, it's you know, I stacked some money. I moved to Central Oregon. Um, let's, you know, let's take some time off two weeks into that. Of course I got bored and thus I created RevPal. And so we're doing very similar things to what Sebastian described, uh, RevOps as a service. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Awesome. I appreciate you all sharing your, uh, your background and a little bit about your story. I think it's going to really set the stage for everyone's perspectives on, on the topic at hand, which is just, you know, how can we support one another as uh, black professionals, black men and women, um, and so I guess, you know, to kick this off and, uh, I want to, I want to make sure, you know, we have some, you know, concise answers just so that we can, you know, really touch on a number of different, uh, uh, you know, realms within this topic. Um, and I guess, I guess the first question for folks is just, what does it mean to be supported by our community as black professionals? Like, what does that mean? And I, I'm actually would love to, I, I talk about this all the time on the podcast. So, you know, really, I would, I would love to hear from you all. And, and of course, Galen, if you have thoughts on this too, but yeah, I mean, what does it mean to be supported by our community? Does anyone have initial reactions or thoughts to that, that, uh, that question? I'll say two words to kick it off. Okay. <laughs> um, to me, it means to be seen okay. and also to be recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of other things I can add to that, but I think as, as, as to start this off, I think being seen, being recognized for who you are, not only what you do and what you can bring, but like who you are as a person fundamentally and yeah. the way so you can connect with one another. So that's uh, where I would start and just to kick this off. <clears throat> I would yeah. have to oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I would say like for me, it's it's been just like a, almost like the work version of a nod, you know? So like, like you know, like you were saying, like to be seen and, and understood and recognized for who you are. Like, you know, I can't even say how many messages I ended with great to see one of us in this world. And then the person on the other hand is like, yes, I get it. <laughs> one of us, <laughs> like just having that, like, oh, like there's someone that we might have a shared experience. You know, we might, we have something in common beyond the work that we do every day, you know, in our personal lives and our family life. And, you know, being able to connect in that way, because um, there are not a lot of us <laughs> in this world. Thanks. For me, I think it's just seen and heard and supported in whatever venture you're you're going through, right? I think one of us, we were we were chatting in, in the backlogs and we're like, hey, you know, it's funny how you can have, you know, 
a white person in your group go out of their way and don't even know you, but they'll go like your post, they'll go comment on it, they'll, they'll share it to their network um, and things like that. And I've noticed for some reason, we just have a problem doing that for each other. Um, what about you, Jacob? You got any thoughts on that? Like, what does it mean to even be, feel be supported by the community? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think the acknowledgement um, is definitely a big piece with LinkedIn, uh, mostly because LinkedIn feels like a popularity contest in high school <laughs> sometimes. Um, so I'm like, "Dang, we got to stick together, and in in we got to click up a little bit more than I feel like we do." Um, and then also. I think the thing that comes to mind is like Tulsa, Black Wall Street, where I'm yeah. like, we need to circulate our dollars back into our communities, you know, um, especially for consulting. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got to recognize, um, you know, who in our community, maybe even have a Rolodex of who does what so we can circulate these dollars back into, um, you know, Black hands, Black pockets. Uh, and I know that might be controversial, but I mean, that's, that's, that's what I want to be supported with. I got a daughter and a family and I want, I want them to thrive. So, um, so yeah, that's what I think of. Yeah. I, I love that you said that Jacob, because like one of my first internships was at a accelerator called Fuel in uh, Manhattan. And so like a bunch of startup founders all in a, in a row and you know, I was just an intern, so I had a lot of downtime. And so I started just interviewing the founders, figuring out what they were all about. And by the end of my time there, I realized that every founder in there was a customer of every other founder in there. Like yeah. they found a way to work together to circulate those dollars. Um, and like, I think we need to become early adopters of each other, pretty much. Uh, the mm -hmm. same way we see other communities doing that. Yep. Yeah. What this makes me think about is like, if you've seen on Instagram, like how when women post something on their own page, it could be about whatever themselves, so let's say I posted a selfie. Um, the way my friends, especially girlfriends, other women come to the page and go, oh my God, you look amazing. You're shining, you're glowing, you're this, you're that. That's the kind of energy that I wish that we had amongst the Black community, men, women, whatever. Like, that's the kind of energy I think that I come in with that I hope to also receive. Because it's one thing of like, if you feel like you are that person who's trying to empower other people, to uplift other people, um, I like continue to be that person. But that's kind of the image I have in my head of the ideal vision for more Black people to be like all those other women on that Instagram page hyping each other up the moment they see you dropping something that they think is hot. You know, like that's a kind of energy that I want us all to have for each other when it comes to supporting businesses. And it's not just about, can I like your stuff? Can I reshare it? But to this point of, can we recircle the money in this group, right? Can we support each other? Rob and I have these conversations all the time about job ski, where we're like, how can we get more people into this? How can we get it, like, not just within our own community, but beyond that? How can we get the word out? How can we spread that further and wider um, and higher, right? We talk about in sales all the time, sell higher, go wider. And it's like, same thing with supporting each other within this Black community. Like, how can we do that more effectively and just in a better way? I love what you say, Galen. <clears throat> I also love Sebastian, like we have to be early adopters of one another and like your example of the accelerator uh, and, you know, Y Combinator does it <laughs> like, like all the YC companies, like that's how they're like able to take off. Like um, if, if I'm a seed stage company, I can reach out to an Airbnb founder or a DoorDash founder and potentially get my product in their company because of that network. And they're willing to take a risk on one another. And um I think in some cases that's not the same. I I, I do want to acknowledge though, um, to that, to the risk taking, and then also the support that you're speaking about, Galen. I, I think that that support comes from a a, a space of abundance, of um, like really like confidence and just happiness with yourself. And um, I think for a number of reasons, you know, the, maybe there's people in our community that don't have that. Um, 
And that's a whole nother topic, right? But I, I think that that goes into it too. Like, I think to be able to, to like go out and compliment people and just show love, like you have to be, you have to have that inside of you. <laughs> and um, and so I think this this that's that's what makes this complicated. And the reason why people don't have that, sure, sure it might be that their own reasons, like their own life and their own decisions and their own whatever. But then there's also the fact that being a black professional in tech is hard and they might see there, there might, it might be risky for them. Like if I'm trying to deal with a CRO and he's a black guy, he's probably the only black CRO. And so how much of a risk can he take on another black owned company? And so it's almost the Obama effect, right? When Obama became president, everybody expected all these things, but it's like, he's the first black president. Like he has to kind of, He's walking a thin line because if he doesn't do well, then there'll never be, there might never be a black president again. And so I think that's the conscious, that's the mindset of, uh, of, uh, or yeah. hold on, I need to interject. Or is that the scarcity mindset to think that way and act that way? Yeah, no, I, I, it's a scarcity mindset. I'm just speaking mm -hmm. to like what might be going through people's minds. Right. Of course. Yeah. The, I, I hear that too. I'm like chicken and egg kind of scenario here. Um, there's this quote I read this morning, by the way, this book right here, Ayanla Van Zant, Acts of Faith. It's okay. a, it's like a daily devotional, but she's, she's amazing. But anyway, this quote on this first page was rather than face how bad I truly felt about me. I stuffed myself with stuffed, st stuffed myself with stuff, puffed myself up with a false sense of power and importance. And mm -hmm. it talks about essentially how like people of color believing they're lacking something already, like coming into situations, feeling like they have to prove their worth instead mm -hmm. of just stepping into situations, knowing their worth, knowing that they're like the best person for the job, knowing they already have everything they need instead of wrapping mm -hmm. themselves in chains and in the flyest clothes just yeah. to just to shine in some situation. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but I, I see that in our culture a lot of like, I need to make sure I'm good before I can bring other people on. Um, so anyway, that's that's what comes to mind when I think about and that part like of the conversation. That comes back to the mindset, right? Because I've tried both ways, right? I've tried coming in and being confident, but I feel like being black in tech, if you come in too confident, there's a very fine line because then you're cocky, right? Then then you're um, unapproachable. If you're or arrogant woman, or arrogant. aggressive. If yep. you're a black woman and you speak up for yourself because you're confident in your abilities, then you're loud, then you're you're disruptive, right? And so I think that's always in the back of our minds. And so we're really trying to navigate this space that we're not really a part of to be quite frank with you. We're not really a part. It's like if we go to a country that doesn't speak English or a language that we understand, right? We're, we're walking a thin line because we, we can't, we can't walk, talk ourselves out of the situation. There's been plenty of times in my career where I'm like, hey, I want to hire. I want to hire someone that looks like me and I want to build them up. I want to manage them. I want to grow their careers. But then maybe who I report to, Mr. CEO, is keeping an eye on who I'm hiring. I've had instances like that where it's like, hey, let me speak to him before you hire him. And it's like, what? You know what I mean? So those things were always walking a tight rope, always. I, I think that's a good example, Christian, because I've seen so many jobs where the dude from Dartmouth brings all of his frat bros into the sales team. And, you know, a three-step interview process becomes one step. Oh, you, you work with John? Oh, okay. He's coming in. You know, he's getting hired. And in my first SDR job, I thought the doors were open. You know, I, I sent a long list of referrals into management. And every time it was some combination of, oh, they don't have enough sales experience. They don't have the right kind of sales experience. They're not a culture fit. And it got, I almost exhausted my whole Rolodex of people that I knew would be good at this job and none of them were given a shot by the person that essentially had the decision making power and if it was me I would have hired them and all of those people went on to be successful in other roles so it's like 
you we don't have like you said christian like we're operating in a space that's almost not for us and so we can't take those advantages okay so, can i can i ask something real quick yep um my question is um if everyone can share an idea that comes to mind let's brainstorm like what are some ways that we can help towards the solution towards this i think we all know that there are a lot of challenges barriers it's difficult. People have tried different methods. And, and I love that that has happened so far. But now the question is really, what's the solution then moving forward? What can we actually do? What can we take ownership of? What action steps can we take to bridge that gap and to support one another towards the mission of uplifting Black people, more Black people? In my opinion, and I'd love to hear everyone else's, but in my opinion, until we start founding companies, until we start owning things, there's just, we're not the decision makers. We're just not, because it's not ours. We're not, this is not our world. Until we make this our world, it's very difficult to do that because we can support each other all day long. But just as Sebastian said, and just how I gave an example, I could want to bring Sebastian in. He could be fully qualified. I could be the, the head of my department. I could, you know, I could have a good reputation, but the moment I try to bring Sebastian in, it's like, oh, I don't know if he's a good culture fit. I don't know. How can you change that other than that person saying, oh, I don't think they're a good culture fit, which is typically the founder of the company or the CEO until that person becomes one of us or an ally, right? I just don't see another way, but I'm, I'm interested in everyone else's opinion there. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think we do have to, like, you know, once you own what you own, like, you can make the decision yourself. Uh, I have a, a sort of weird, controversial opinion. It kind of ties into, like, the founding story of my business, but I think we need advocates within the community that we're not welcome in right now, uh, on top of being able to own our own thing. I think we both need pressure in there, you know, somebody knocking the door and saying like, this is wrong. Like, why have we allowed, you know, everybody from one community to join and nobody from another community to join? Um, and we also need to take ownership, invest in each other and have our own things. Like, I, I think it's kind of twofold. And I think you do have to rely on an advocate in the privileged position, so to speak. And I've had that. I, I want to shout, I want to shout someone out, an incredible woman um, who, who brought me into Contentful, Adrian Del Bonta. Um, she's not Black, she's, you know what I mean, but she was an advocate and she always made me feel okay. For instance, I was always very careful with my hair. I still am, right? It's the reason why I wear a hat. I, I don't know why, but Sebastian has helped me out with that a little bit, but she, the, the first day I was brought in, I think she saw that I was, I had some hesitancies and for some reason I felt okay telling her why. And she sat me down and was like, look, wear short sleeves, your tattoos are fine. Who cares? Who cares about this? I got you. And so I want to point that out because there are advocates out there. They're just, it's, it's hard to find. And I don't want this podcast to be painted as like, oh, it's all white people because it's not. There are some advocates out there that are just allies for us, but we need more of them, right? We need more of them. And maybe we amplify our voice and that will grow that community, the allies, the allies, right? So, I mean. That's a good point, Christian. I actually like, I, that's a good point about that, amplifying our own voice. And maybe that'll bring in more advocates. Jacob, do you, do you have ideas on, on this and how we can, you know, come together and support one another? or what the solution might be to solve this? Yeah, I mean, one, I think hiring, if we're gonna hire a lot, I mean, consultants are a lot of business these days. Uh, like I said before, looking at the Rolodex and, and seeing who you're hiring for these roles. I mean, there's plenty of qualified people of all shades and colors. Um, so looking internally to our own community for those solutions and for those providers, those service providers, uh, and I think the people who are in roles in those companies, I think it's a, it's a moment where there's really an opportunity to speak truth to power. Like we don't have to actually be silent about these uh, atrocities that happen internally for these companies where people don't belong or aren't getting those positions where sometimes I feel like, and I mean, 
this is this is hard. This kind of happened to me at DocuSign, but I had to like fall on my sword a little bit. I was like, I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna just I'm gonna have to die at this company to have to speak truth to power because otherwise they're not gonna see. So I think one of the things, and this might be this is a little bit dramatic and drastic, but we have to drain our resources from these companies that don't want to realize and don't want to hire black folks for the same reasons we've been talking about. Like, oh, let me put them through the extra, you know, checkpoint just to make sure they're qualified and all these things. Well, no, we're not gonna do that. Let's we're gonna have we're gonna have these companies that are heavy with black folks because they're the ones who see and advocate and and support our communities. And the ones that don't don't deserve us, <laughs> you know. And even if that means struggling for a little bit more, like financially and leaving those companies and trying to find the right fit, like doing that. You know, and that's where community support comes in. It's like, okay, if I'm going to do that, I need I need support from my community to shout me out on LinkedIn and post me and like, sh- you know, do all the things that that can build me up so I can find those companies and find those roles. So yeah, that's 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 my opinion. That's deep. We need to drain these companies. Oh man, hey, you sound like a Black Panther right now. I know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's deep right there. But I like that. I like it. Um. So I got a couple ideas and you know, I, I'm an idea person, um, but two things that come to mind. So the first that comes to mind with what you're saying, Jacob, I was thinking like, what if we had like a, um, like a job board or like some type of, you know how there's like top 50 startups to work for in New York or in California. What if we had top 50 companies to work for if you're black? Top, like what if there was like um, a census we could do to see, and it's based off the numbers, like how many black people are in leadership? How many black people are hired? Like we survey those folks. Like, how do you, do you feel like you're include, in, included and do you feel like you're respected within this company? And I think that could really, and then on, and then my other idea was, you know, governments, sometimes they have to work with companies that are, or prioritize companies that are like women owned or black owned. And I think in the private sector, we can be doing more of that, but it, it does take us taking these more leadership positions, being in buying positions being founders of companies, I think, I think as a, as a, as a culture, like we should actually take that seriously Um, because, you know, we represent these organizations and if we're going to partner with outreach or we're going to partner with sales law, we need to make sure that they, their values align with ours because I think we're operating a space where there's, everything is competitive. (laughs) Like there's not too many companies that like, like even the most technical things like the cloud you got gcp you got microsoft you got aws you got so like there's so like that should be included in the criteria is like you know um your values as a company i think we're already doing it when it comes to like green and um just like the environment and carbon credit stuff like that but uh i think that can be super powerful if certain corporations also have said we're going to take this and we're going to take diversity and uh as a as a component to us partnering with one another so just my ideas there i just froze on that one like i that one hit me hard Robert. like that's a i don't know how to react to that one <laughs> because it makes so much sense right like just align your values um yeah that uh, yeah sorry christian i cut you no oh no i was just i I mean i'm just curious as to the root cause right because let's say we open up a job rec for a manager of of, of revenue operations right i'm gonna get 200 applications for that for that role right and out of those 200 i might and i'm not talking about just black i'm talking about just people of color i might get 10, 10 people might. And unfortunately, half of those are going to be unqualified. Every role that I've ever had to open up, I've always took a look at the candidates and like, huh, wonder why, you know, no one else has really applied for this, right? So I'll have to go out and, you know, go on my network and share and say, hey, you know, da, 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 in hopes that I can get some people of color to to apply that may have not applied. So my question, my mind always goes to why don't you apply? And I think it goes back to the very beginning of this conversation where it's like what we think of ourselves, right? Um, 
And I, I, I want to point out, especially black women, I think black women have it way worse than the black men in the tech space um, from what I've from what I've witnessed. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's like, why don't we do that? Why don't we support each other? But why don't we even make the effort? Or is there a combination of the two? Right. Like, is there is there a reason behind that? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't I don't know. Well, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for all Black women, and I will never do that. But I think the challenge for me personally is also that I don't really fit into the box that's being created or the job description that's being created for a lot of companies, a lot of roles. There's so much else that I could do and that I would like to do or that I'm interested in or curious about or passionate about. So for me, it's never been the challenge of, feeling or believing that I'm not good enough for this. I've definitely been on the other side. Like I think Sebastian, when you, yeah, I think it was you who started in your introduction talking about how you didn't get the, you know, manager positions or opportunities. And I resonate with that hundred percent because that's where I was at before going into enablement where I was convinced I was sure 100% after being a BDR, after being an AE that this was the path moving forward. And this was also after I had, you know, co-founder Rev Genius, done a bunch of things on the side. And I was like, I can do this. Like, I know I can be really good, like SDR, BDR manager. However, the hiring managers did not believe that. And so even though I put myself into positions, I even got referrals into companies from good friends of mine, didn't get those opportunities. And so immediately I was like, not again in a privileged position where I could just take a step back and say, let me readjust now and see what else I could do or take a step back. That wasn't an option for me. So at that point, what do you do moving forward to make sure that you can move ahead in your career? You can go in the trajectory you want to go into. So tying this all back, yes, as a whole, it is difficult um, to get the right opportunities at the right time, but it's also like what you have on the table to deal with and what kind of the expectations are, like how the job descriptions are being made or what a company realistically or unrealistically is looking for may or may not match up with who you are and what you want to do. So it's just not as straightforward to me to apply all of this and say like, here's the straight line, because it's not in reality. I think you either got to uh, play the game or make your own game. And <clears throat> the game, I, and that's a fact. I mean, I just like the game, every game has its rules, right? You know, like even if we think about basketball, if we can change the rules to where a certain type of people would perform better in basketball. Like if there's no scoring in the paint, then if you're a shooter, you're going to probably win versus if you're like a post-up player, you're not going to win, right? And I think it's the same with these companies and these rules that they put in place. But I think what, what ends up happening is either you get like somebody just become like a uh, like a Kevin Durant, somebody who historically would be a, a, a somebody that would be in the paint and posting up. And now they can score on the outside. They just be they, now they're like the GOAT. They're like the greatest of all time. Or you get somebody that's going to cheat. <laughs> and so I think that's what ends up happening today. I think the black people, I think what the way the game is set up today, you're either getting the companies are either getting, getting like incredibly talented black professionals which is awesome or they're getting people that just know how to play the game and are playing the game to their advantage and um and i and and, the, and that game is stupid it's like why like why like why would you have that risk why not change the rules so where it allows people to play to their advantage um because that's actually the fair thing to do and so um yeah i, I think it's either play the game or you know, make your own game. And so I, I think making your own game is what we talked about, like being founders, starting our own company, starting our own consultancy. So then it's like, hey, we come up with the rules and we decide what's important and what's meaningful. And, or it's like, all right, either I'm a great sales manager, either I got the five plus years of managing people and I went to this college and worked for these companies, or I'm gonna put that shit on my resume and you're gonna ask me about it and I'm gonna tell you I did it. And I'm gonna still get the job. <laughs> so, there's, and the, Robert, not to cut you off, but I want every black person in the world to hear this. There's, you got to play the game, right? 
But this is where this is where we get tripped up is that there's different rules for different people. And I want everyone to recognize that there are different rules for different people. The same rules that your colleague might have to abide by doesn't mean those rules govern you. And I've seen that over and over and over and over again in my career, over and over again. So no, that's a fact. That's a fact. I have a question for I have a question for the group. So we talked about we talked about a lot of things. This has been a very dope conversation. We talked about, you know, uh, what it means to feel supported amongst one another. Um, we talked about ideas on, uh, or we talked about why people, why our people sometimes may not want to support or can't support. And it may be like, they're just not secure in their situation or they just mentally are not there. We also talked about ideas on how we can support one another or just generally speaking, which I love that section. But I think something that we might've glanced over is the obligation. Should we as people be obliged to help one another? Like, we didn't even start there. Like, should we as people, like, what's in it for us? What's in it to, uh, as Black people, to support our communities? Our future. I'll, I'll take the first one on that. But I, I do think we are um, obligated to help each other. And because I think every successful Black person that you speak to in tech, someone has helped them to get there. And so I'm of the big belief that you need to pay it forward. Also, as a father, what's in it for me is that my daughter, and I'm almost getting emotional because it's very real, is that my daughter and my son don't have to go through the same struggles that I went through, the same way that my mother did that for me in the same way her mother did that for her, right? And we, all of our ancestors did that, right? I mean, we're looking, we look back at, at these at these three fine fellows right here, right? And it would, yes, because if we're not obligated to do it, nothing is going to change. And that's what we need is more leaders to say, yes, we are obligated to do this. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, of course you need to meet someone halfway, right? But you, you are obligated to help. Awesome. Jacob, Sebastian, y'all thoughts on that? I think Chris just said it perfectly. I think we are obligated, you know, for one, because how did we get here? through so many people's sacrifices uh, and so many people's selflessness. And so I think paying it forward is the least we can do is, you know, take what we got and give out that same amount. If anything, we should be multiplying it and giving out more uh, to the next generation because uh, yeah, the, I, I don't want to see a talk like this in 40 years. And then I'm like, damn, we have 40 years and what progress have we made? You know, I think anytime you're a part of a community, you know, it is your obligation to move that community forward or else what are you doing here? You ain't in the community, hey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's a perfect segue to what I was gonna say. And that is, this is not our system. We are working within a system that was not created for us by us at all, capitalism, heteronormativity, patriarchy, all the systems that we operate in. I mean, tech tech exacerbates all the systems that we see in our countries, in our country. And I mean, I think like, like everyone has said, both y'all have said already, like we're obligated not only to bring in other people of color, but also to change the system. <laughs> like we literally have... Uh, we're, we're like falling into place of what other people have done. And that's, I think, where people don't fit and don't feel like they fit is because community is not there, right? We're not having cookouts at these companies. We're having drinking parties, you know, and, and, and enabling toxic behaviors that don't even suit us, you know, as, as people in general, but also as Black folks. So, I mean, I feel like we just need to <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kind of radical in that respect where I'm like, break this shit down to the ground. You know, like it needs to change. And that, that's where I'm like really excited about being a founder because I'm like, okay, I'm going to, everyone who works for me is going to make six figures. I don't care what your job is. Everyone with me is going to feel like a real family, a real community. Like your job is not going to be on the line because we're always going to be profitable and always going to have the means and not depend on, uh, you know, uh, you know, the capital from, from some of these companies that can just pull it out and destroy your company in two seconds, right? Like things like that. 
So I think, yes, it's, it's about bringing people in, but it's also about like really changing the structure of how we do things. And obviously that needs to happen over time, but I feel like that's, that's the real solution to change the system. Damn. Yeah. I like to have a drink every now and then, but I, I think I'd rather have the drink at the cookout for sure. Uh, <laughs> Galen, what about you? Do you have any thoughts on that? You have I mean, any- nothing too different from what everyone else already shared. I think about my own story, my own family journey, history, and how both of my biological parents moved from Eritrea and East Africa to Sweden to make a better life for our family. And so I have always that in back of my head, thinking about what did it take for them to get here, for me to have an opportunity to start with didn't have the greatest start to an opportunity, but I made something happen based off of where I came from. So that in mind kind of fuels me to move forward. And then I also keep in mind, like what I'm doing now is not just to benefit me or the people around me, but is to what everyone else said for the next generation. And I don't have any kids yet, but it is something that I am super excited about in my future to have a family. So I do this for them. I don't even know them yet, right? They're not even on this earth yet. I do video diaries talking to my future kids because I think it's important to pass forward what the thoughts are, the experiences are, the feelings are right now in this real time for me and for them to look back on in whenever in the future. So that's what I keep in mind. That's why I think it's important to empower and to support one another because there will be some other little girl little boys in this world right now that might not have the same opportunities as I did and even though I would say I didn't grow up in the most privileged ways definitely not but I am a privileged adult now and I get to make the choice what I can impact who I can impact in a positive direction moving forward and that is not just the micro immediate family but it's everybody else that now becomes part of the larger group so that's what what I focus on. Respect. <clears throat> How about you, Robert? <laughs> oh well, thank you for asking, Galen. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I I agree with all y'all for real. Uh, but the the one something that's coming to mind for me is last November I was able to uh, take a trip to Africa to the motherland and went to a few countries. One of the countries that really um, struck a, 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 a important. A uh, piece of my heart was uh, Ghana, um, mostly because, you know, as a Black African American, um, uh, the Atlantic slave trade, those were my ancestors. So to be able to, you know, walk through the doors, those last doors that they walked through before being uh, forcibly brought to America, it was just a very meaningful um, event uh, and thing to experience for me personally. But uh, as this relates to our conversation, although they did not choose, or, or my ancestors did not choose to come to America. <laughs> they weren't like, yeah, I'm on a boat. Um, they did choose to survive. And I think I owe it, I, I'm just going to speak for me personally. I think I, we owe it, you know, I, definitely for the future, but also for our ancestors, because um, my ancestors could have easily, there were certain a- uh, Africans that like said, no, I'd rather die than to um, go through this basically uh, this experience that might be death on earth. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'd rather just end it now. And um, and for my ancestors to say, you know, I'm going to endure this. And I'm going to try, I'm going to keep fighting. Even if fighting just means surviving, that has allowed me to be where I am today. And so um, I think it's definitely important to continue to pay that forward for the next generations. And um, I think, you know, as, like what else are, what else is there to live for i think uh in a world where it's like all like abundant and it's like you know it's all about me me and like uh trying to you know get something now and go party now and do this now i think that it, living for something that's a bit more meaningful is actually what gives you purpose in life and um and so i think i find purpose in helping our community and um and so I, I definitely, I won't say that p- Black people have, t- this the, This is their responsibility. I'm not going to put that. I think it's a decision we all need to make individually. But I, I think what this conversation does is it shows different leaders. It shows why we should and 
what it means to us on a spiritual, emotional level. And um, I hope that it inspires people to, to also uh, kind of claim what we're claiming that, yeah, you know, we, go, we, we take responsibility for our community and we're going to take responsibility for making sure that we help one another. So that's my, that's my thoughts on it. But uh, deep conversation. <laughs> I teary eyed for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this is this is this has been incredible. I think I, I honestly think we could end it on that note. I I, I think we covered everything. And um, but before we end it, you know, does anyone have any final thoughts or like, you know, any any final thoughts that maybe you didn't get to express, you know, throughout this conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll just what you just said just inspired me to say what I'm about to say, and that is you know, on my dad's side of the family, I'm, I'm black and Creole French. My mother's Creole French. And um, they're both from Louisiana. My, my family on my dad's side, all pick cotton, indentured servants. My grandparents don't know who their parents were because they were on the run, you know? So like my lineage on my father's side ends, you know, in a very, like t a generation and a half ago is all I can go back to. Um, and somebody, this this white person actually asked me like, oh, what does your name mean? I was like, I don't know, slavery? <laughs> like, that's the only thing that comes to mind when I think of my last name. Yeah. Um, but anyway, when I thought about my mother's name, I was able to go really far back in the French lineage of like where her name comes from. And so what it made me just realize is like, not only did my ancestors survive, but there's also a deep rooted history on my mother's side that just empowered everything that I know and then beyond that like like you said our our ancestors even beyond all of that built pyramids and farmed and cultivated land and did all these things from like the beginning of time like we are literally the ancestors of the survivors from then <laughs> you know uh and that that feels empowering to me I'm like oh man there's there is well beyond what I can remember like how far do we really need to go back to realize how much how privileged we are to even be alive yeah. uh, so that's that's the the thing that comes to me I'm just happy to be here happy to be alive and sharing this this conversation with y'all or Sebastian Christian any 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 final thoughts or you know yeah any final thoughts or takes I, you know, one thing I want to clarify, right, we were talking about our, is the Black community obligated? And I think, Robert, after you spoke, you kind of switched my mindset a tad bit. I would say that it is a choice, right? In any society, you're going to have leaders, you're going to have people that have different specialties and different ways to impact the world. And I think if you put someone like us in a, uh, if you put a, if you try to force a, a, a circle into a square hole, it's not going to work out, right? And so I take that back. I want to say that if you feel the calling in you that you are a leader and that you want to do something to make a change, then you are obligated. If that is not your thing, then you're not obligated to do anything. You can, you can, you know, whatever makes you happy at the end of the day. Um, so with that said, I appreciate what you said, Robert. I mean, that was, that was deep. Um, and yeah, so that's, I will, that's just, just to add on, I, I will, I, I will say though, I did say that you're not obligated, but I, I do think though, whatever, whatever decision is, there's always a, um, an outcome. <laughs> so oh, always. It's a choice, it's an, but it's, it's a choice, but I think, uh, as we were saying earlier, like if you ain't helping the community, you're out the community, and that's a choice you're making too. So uh, I, I, you know, I think that's something to consider. Like, uh, but I agree with you. I'm, I'm just, think, I, I just want to add that on to like, because yeah. maybe I wasn't clear. Like, yes, it's a choice, but still, if you choose, if you're, if you become aware and you be and you have the information and you are choosing to go this route and say okay i know what our communities are going through and i know this but i'm choosing not it's one thing to it's one thing to choose out of ignorance or desperation it's another thing to be choosing when you're you know you're the c black cro of this company and you're only hiring tech bros like that's a choice and, and that uh, happens quite often <laughs> that right. happens quite often the first time I spoke to Galen was about that I was like you know I'm so disappointed I had all these black CROs and VPs all lined up right for just just to have a coffee chat I don't want anything from you I just want to chat and network and 
nine times out of 10, they're the ones that'll no show, not say anything, won't message and say, hey, sorry, I had another meeting. And I just found that very odd and kind of like took me back quite a bit to be friends. So, Bastion. Yeah, I think um, everything that was said, I couldn't have said it better. I, like, I don't have too much to add. The only thing I would say is that the first black CRO that I ever met became a client of ours. And so let's move this forward and let's, I think, action item for everyone here. Let's figure out how to become early adopters in each other. I think that's the best takeaway. And Damn. we can start with Jobski, signing up for Jobski. <laughs> free FOMO, free FOMO. <laughs> hey, no, for everybody, you know, let's everybody go ahead and um, uh, how can we support, how can, really, all, we have listeners of all demographics, so how can people support you all too, like, um, let's start with you, Jacob, Sebastian, Christian. Y'all go ahead and shout out which I want to shout out. And then we're also going to put in the show notes so people want to check your websites out and check out what you all do professionally. Yeah, I mean, for me right now, I'm um, support me by uh, checking out my YouTube channel. I'm about to start just dropping all my knowledge there because LinkedIn feels like a black hole and I'm out there trying to put out objective content. <laughs> and that's not the place, I think, for objective content and like know how, you know, when it comes to outreach. So uh, I really believe that I am the most knowledgeable consultant out there about that platform and how the other platforms weave into it. And, you know, I, I, I got a chip on my shoulder about that when people charge, you know, obscure amounts for the same services. And I'm like, why am I not getting these same these same deals when like I'm the second employee and I you know know more than I can even even begin to express so um YouTube channel is called zebra at zebra can and then also yeah come check out my website I need to update that right now <laughs> to make sure that it's that everyone oh, can see what I'm doing it's, it's yeah um <laughs> yeah zebraconsulting.com it's x-e-b-r-a zebraconsulting.com yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Don't feel bad, Jacob. Uh, if anyone see my website, it's not pretty either. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, Jacob, for you, I'm glad we had this meeting because for everyone, you know, I offer RevOps as a service. So if you're a go-to-market leader um, and you need any kind of RevOps service, uh, we do that either hourly or subscription-based. Uh, I think what's important here is my man, Jacob. I was actually, I have a connection with an outreach guru that I like to reach out to uh, from time to time when I have that kind of work. And I just mentioned, I just signed to SO. Big part of that's going to be outreach. So I'm going to holler at you after this. Um, so yeah, if, if anything, if you guys need anything, it's just RevOps as a service. Feel free to reach out, go revpal.com. Uh, my name is Christian Fries and uh, yeah. Awesome. And for me, it's all LinkedIn. So find me on LinkedIn, connect with me. I, that's where I put in all our events, put in our service offerings. What I do is almost exactly the same, if not exactly the same as Christian. And Jacob, for that same reason, I'm gonna have some questions for you too. Uh, I don't have a newly signed client with outreach like Christian. So maybe prioritize his conversation above mine, but uh, I think there's a way for us to work together because we've seen outreach a few times. Awesome. Awesome. Gail, any uh, final words from you before we end the show? I just want to say that I love this vibe, what's happening right now, even within this smaller group of us um, and how everyone's connecting the dots and like helping each other out. Um, I would say two things on my end, because I'm going to be that person. So uh, <laughs> one is on a personal level, I am really in the space right now of looking for meaningful recommendations on LinkedIn. And so this is mainly for those who are, you know, who knows me more on a personal professional level who can leave a credible recommendation. So that's one thing. And I always return that favor uh, if we do have a legit relationship. I don't want anyone who doesn't really know me, who's never had a conversation to leave a recommendation because there's no point in that. There's no validation in that. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is uh, the new, the uh, the tech sales experience community on Jobski. 
So this is something I'm really excited about because I come from that community building uh, background. And so I, I won with that, want to be able to uplift what Robert has created with Jobski. I think it's an absolutely brilliant platform for people to come together from various different backgrounds. There's a lot of things happening right now on Jobski. So the other thing to this is also what we're doing here today on the tech sales experience, getting that on the platform and creating our own community around these conversations. So whoever hears this on YouTube or you get the snip on uh, TikTok or LinkedIn, wherever, um, just know that there is a place for you to come back to and connect with other people. So those are the two things I wanted to, to mention. Um, how about you, Robert? Nothing on my end. You know, I just want to thank you all. Um for uh, this conversation. Um, it's been super interesting, super insightful. And um, I really appreciate you all sharing your all's perspectives and stories. And um, so, yeah, so thank you. My only ask is to the viewers, like, subscribe to the show. <laughs> you know, as, we're YouTubers, so like, like, subscribe to the show. We got 16 subscribers, get us up to 20. And I'm just playing, but yeah, until next time. <laughs> You're not playing, but thank you everyone for joining the conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you and we can't wait to continue to have impactful, meaningful conversations with you.